important of using data to advance health research, especially to historically affected communities such as Latinos and African Americans. So this afternoon, it's my pleasure to welcome a panel of experts that will highlight the following. For example, how data from the Seoul study has influenced health and decision making, perspective from researcher, best practices to advance health research in diverse populations, and also a brief overview of advancing health research through the All of Us Research Hub and workbench tools for researchers from different backgrounds. So before we begin this webinar, I want to introduce Ocean, who will be co-moderating this webinar with me, as well as presenting polls over the course of the webinar. So welcome, Ocean. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Christine, and welcome everyone. Um, as Christine mentioned, um, I'll be co-moderating and mainly uh, just administering the polls. Um, so with that being said, let's get started with our first poll. Uh, this is open to all participants. So please feel free to share your insights with us. Uh, we'll give about a minute to respond to the first question um, and then go from there. Um, and so the first question is up, I believe, on the, on the uh, presentation. Have you heard of the All of Us Research Program? And it's just a simple yes, no answer. <clears throat> Give it about another 30 seconds or so. Awesome. All right, thank you guys for answering that. Um, oh, and there are the results. Um, wow, so there, there's a good amount of people, you know, who haven't heard of the All of Us Research Program. Um, some of some people on this webinar have. Um, uh, Christina, at the end of this webinar, will be giving us a brief overview of the All of Us Research Program. So for those of you who haven't heard about it, you know, we'll be going through that, so yeah. And now we'll launch our second polling question. Oh, that's the first one. We'll get our second polling question up in a second. All right, our second polling question. Have you participated in health research? Option A, yes. Option B, no. Option C, no, but I plan to, or I prefer not to say. And we'll give you all about a minute to respond to this question as well. about another 30 seconds or so. Awesome. Wow, it's great. Um, these results are awesome. Uh, the majority of people in this webinar have participated in health research. Um, there's a good portion who haven't as well. I just wanted to highlight that. Um, you know, through this through this webinar, we'll be discussing you know the benefits of health research. Uh, for those who haven't participated in health research, we'll be going through that so you can uh, get a better understanding of that. And those who have participated in health uh, participated in health research, this will be a good overview of some of the benefits of why we participate in health research. Uh, particularly in diverse communities and why it's important in diverse communities. Uh, with that, I'll hand it back to Christine. 
Thank you, Ocean. So data analysis is a method used by researchers for reducing data to a story and interpreting it to derive insights. In health research, data helps to understand diseases and health conditions, such as the causes, the symptoms, or for understanding how many people are affected by a particular disease or condition. So the inclusion of ethnically diverse populations in health research is crucial for addressing disparities in health status, status and care. One example of a study that addresses this issue is the Hispanic Community Health Study, or the, SOL, the study of Latinos, also known as SOL, the SOL study. So this multicenter epidemiologic study in Hispanic and Latino populations assessed that the role of assimilation in the prevalence and development of a disease. And also they identified factors playing a protective or harmful role in the health of Hispanic or Latinos in the United States. But let's hear more from our first speaker, Dr. Cristina Corde, who received her doctorate degree in epidemiology from the University of North Carolina. She returned to her hometown of Miami to complete a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Miami in behavioral medicine and cardiovascular disease. Under Dr. Neil Schneiderman, the site principal investigator for the SOL study in Miami. Following her postdoc, Dr. Cordero continues her research with the SOL study as an assistant scientist. Her research interests include women's health, pediatrics, diabetes, and pregnancy complications as they relate to health disparities in Hispanic and Latinos. So today, Dr. Cordero will highlight how data from the SOL study has influenced health and decision-making. Welcome, Dr. Cordero. Thank you so much, Christine. I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about some of the key findings from the Hispanic Community Health Study or the study of Latinos. Um, from now on, I will say the SOL study to keep it short, and that's how we uh, commonly refer to it amongst uh, us researchers. Uh, my name is Christina Cordero, and um, I am a researcher with the SOL study at the Miami site at the University of Miami. Um, and I've been there for quite a, uh, some time. So if you have any questions, I will be happy to take them. Um, but I think Christine prefers that we hold questions until the end of the presentation. And I'll be happy to take any questions in either English or Spanish if uh, you'd rather uh, prefer one language over the other. Uh, next slide, Christine. Thank you. So just before I begin, I wanted to acknowledge the funders of our study. Uh, the SOL study is supported by the NHLBI and six other NIH institutes listed here. I would also like to disclose that I have no conflicts of interest to, to report. Next slide. So I want to start by briefly going over the SOL study. The SOL study is a multi-center community-based cohort study. Um, it, recruited participants from households selected via a two-stage area probability sample in communities around uh, uh, four field centers in the United States. Um, what this means is that we aim to recruit a population-based samples that is representative of the communities uh, where Hispanic populations are highly concentrated. Um, we have four sites in Miami, Chicago, New York, and California, which I'll describe later. Um, and we've been following these participants for quite some time. We started recruitment in 2008, which was the baseline visit. Um, and we continued recruitment from 2008 to 2011. We enrolled approximately 16,415 U.S. Hispanic Latino adults, which makes us the largest uh, cohort study of Hispanics in the United States. We have approximately 4,000 participants per field center who identify as Hispanic and Latino. Uh, we have continued to fo follow these participants. Every year we call them and there's a, an annual follow-up telephone call. And then in 2014, we started bringing them back into the clinic and we uh, conducted a series of exams on participants that were able to return. Approximately 11,623 participants returned uh, about six years after the baseline examination. And right now, as of 
this year, we are uh, starting up the visit three and we're bringing participants back in for another examination. Um, and we have plans to continuing to study this population to see uh, several uh, different health outcomes. If you're interested in more detailed description about the SOUL study, I have included uh, two papers, uh, information here from two papers uh, that might help give you more uh, details. One is by Levanche and the other is by Sorley. And th these were both published in 2010. And at the end of my presentation, I'll have the full uh, citation if you're interested in, in reading more. Next slide. So these are the four sites that I was referring to. Um, uh, as you can see, study representation is in the West, the South, the East, and in the Midwest of the United States. And this is important because of the diversity of Hispanic groups that are encompassed by these sites. Um, in San Diego, we had a, a large uh, proportion of our participants were of Mexican background. In Miami, a large proportion of our participants were of Cuban and Central American background. In the Bronx, a large proportion uh, were of Puerto Rican and Dominican background. And in Chicago, we had also a large proportion of Mexican, uh, Central American background, as well as Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. Next slide. So this population of Seoul, um, it was selected to be representative of the target population in each community rather, rather than the entire US population. The study participants were selected to obtain approximately one third between 18 to 44 years and two thirds between 45 to 74 years. So we oversampled people that were older in this study. And the purpose of this was that we really wanted to see some of these um, outcomes such as heart disease and diabetes, um, and, and stroke and mortality. And if, uh, had we sampled younger people, we probably wouldn't see those endpoints. So we sampled older people uh, with hopes of being able to see that in our study. And importantly, we uh, were able to sample um, large sample sizes of, of different Hispanic Latino background groups. And this includes Cubans, Central and South Americans, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, and Dominicans. And this is, uh, the first study to actually do this, to actually look at Hispanics, not as a monolith, as one group, but as different background groups and kind of try to understand where the differences by these background groups in health that we really don't know. Next slide. So the goals of the SOUL study are to identify risk factors that may have a protective or harmful role in the development of cardiovascular disease and other chronic diseases in Hispanic and Latinos. Study participants underwent an extensive clinic examination to determine baseline disease prevalence and evaluate potential risk and protective factors. And this baseline examination included a wide range of exams and um, measurements from uh, height and weight and blood pressure to um, ECGs, uh, uh, blood draws. Um, and we are continuing to follow these participants participants and they're undergoing more examinations currently. Next slide. So we originally set out to focus on a few main outcomes in Seoul. Some of our risk factors of interest have become their own risk factors. Um, and we are currently uh, looking into some of them as outcomes. So today I'm gonna to be uh, talking about the main outcomes on the left, including coronary heart disease, stroke, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, cognitive function, and mental health. But we also have extensive data on all the outcomes and risk factors on the right. Um, so if anyone is interested in studying these or collaborating with uh, Seoul, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll be happy to connect you. Um, as I said, a lot of the, the outcomes on the right start off as risk factors or things that we want to see in conjunction with the main outcomes, but there have been several papers published on um, a lot of these outcomes in the right. So even though I won't be discussing them today, if you are interested in them, I, I do encourage you to do um, some literature reviews uh, to see what publications we have on these. Next slide. So I'm gonna begin with our main outcome, which is cardiovascular disease. In Seoul, we classified CVD or cardi cardiovascular disease um, as either having been diagnosed with congenital heart disease, or sorry, coronary heart disease or CHD, or stroke at baseline. We determined this by self-report, but also had our participants undergo an ECG to look at evidence of an MI. 
we found a low prevalence overall in Hispanics. And this is when compared to other prevalence estimates in other studies, a uh, lower compared to non-Hispanic whites and lower compared to non-Hispanic blacks. Uh, these findings have been reported elsewhere and they form the basis of the Hispanic paradox. And if you haven't heard of the Hispanic par paradox, simply it's that despite low socioeconomic status and increased prevalence of some key risk factors that I will discuss later, for some reason, um, Hispanics and Latinos have lower risk for CBD, and that's something that we really want to understand. So in Seoul, we looked at um, uh, C uh, CBD cardiovascular disease by background, and we found that um, CHD was highest among Puerto Rican men and women, and uh, also Cuban and Dominican women, all had about a 5% prevalence of CHD. Uh, by, with stroke, we found that um, it was highest among Dominican men with about a 4% prevalence and among Puerto Rican women with a 2% prevalence. The main risk factors that we were able to identify for CHD include hypertension, diabetes, smoking, chronic stress, earlier onset with high BMI, and loneliness. And these numbers here correspond to the main author and year of the publications. Uh, below. And again, I will provide a full list of references at the end if you're interested in learning more about these research studies. For stroke risk factors, we identified hypertension, diabetes, and smoking in women. Next slide. Another large outcome that we wanted to uh, understand was metabolic syndrome. Um, and metabolic syndrome, if uh, you're not too familiar with it, uh, encompasses uh, having three or more risk factors for cardiovascular disease. And these include waist circumference, elevated triglyceride levels, elevated cholesterol, elevated blood pressure measurements, or an elevated fasting glucose. In the SOUL study, we found a prevalence of 34% in men and 36% in women. And this increased greatly with age. In the age group of 70 to 74, we saw that over two thirds uh, had metabolic syndrome. This is also um, a higher prevalence compared to non-Hispanic whites and non-Hispanic blacks. Uh, by background, uh, pre prevalence estimates range from 41% in Puerto Ricans, women, and 35% in Cuban men, to at the lowest 27% in South American men and women. Risk factors that we have been able to identify for metabolic syndrome involve age, sex, and family conflicts. And protective factors that we've identified um, include diet quality. Next slide. Diabetes is also a main outcome that I'm sure you've heard lots about. Uh, in the SOUL study, we looked at type two diabetes determined by either a fasting plasma glucose or FPG, or FPG an oral glucose tolerance test, or OGTT, or an elevated uh, hemoglobin A1C. Um, if they also reported having taken anti-diabetic uh, anti medication, they were classified as having diabetes. And this is uh, the way the American Diabetes Association defines diabetes. We had a prevalence of 69% of Hispanic Latinos at baseline that had diabetes. 41.3% of these were aware of having diabetes, which means that a large proportion of our population was not aware of having diabetes once uh, when we first saw them at baseline. Only 48% of our population that uh, we found had diabetes had a glycemic control. So this was uh, alarming to us. And um, to us, it identified an area that uh, requires much more attention. Uh, by background group, uh, we found a higher prevalence of diabetes in Mexicans with an 18.3% prevalence and the lowest uh, prevalence among South Americans with a 10.2%. Risk factors for diabetes include length of time in the U.S. for migrants, lower household income, lower education, cardiovascular disease risk factors, and loneliness. And protective factors that we were able to identify were social support. We also looked at hypertension in the soul study, and this was defined again uh, using AHA criteria as having an elevated blood pressure 
over 140 over 90, um, or as having or taking antihypertensive medications. We identified 25.5% overall of our population having hypertension, which is a bit lower than non-Hispanic whites and non-Hispanic blacks. Um, and this was higher, a bit, a bit higher for men at 26.1% than for women at 25.3%. The prevalence rates ranged by background again, and this ranged from 34.3% among Dominicans having the highest prevalence to South American women having the lowest prevalence at 17.2%. Risk factors that we identified for hypertension include age, sex, geographic location, BMI, um, and interestingly, we found that it wasn't associated with education or income, even though we thought it might be. Uh, so some protective factors we found were also physical activity and social support. Obesity was another main outcome that we studied. Um, we found a prevalence of 37% for men and 42% for women using the standard definition of, of a BMI over 30. And for uh, a BMI over 40, we found uh, a, a prevalence of 4% for men and even higher for women of 7%. This ranged again by background and it was highest among Puerto Ricans and lowest among South Americans. Risk factors that we identified included study site, length of residency in the US, sodium intake and shorter sleep duration. Next slide. And then we also looked at uh, cognitive function and it's uh, pretty much looking at um, how they measured in the several tests that we administered to them. Uh, these include the SVLT, the uh, SIS, the DSS and the WF uh, tests that are common uh, measures of cognitive function. By background group, we found that Puerto Ricans scored lowest on the SELVT and Dominicans scored lowest on the, on the WF, TSS, and SIS. Um, risk factors for this were older age, depressive symptoms, uh, geographic location, chronic stress, too much or too little sleep, and also a wide range of CVD risk factors were associated with uh, decreased cognitive function. Protective factors that we were able to identify include higher education, higher income, English language preference, and female sex. Next slide. And then for our final outcome that I will discuss today was depression. Uh, we looked at depressive symptoms assessed with a 10 item form of the CSESD, which is a common form used to assess uh, depression in research studies. Uh, using this assessment, we found that 27% of our population had symptoms of depression. This was higher among women with 33% reporting symptoms of depression and 22% of men reporting symptoms of depression. We also found differences by background group. Uh, symptoms of depression were highest among Puerto Ricans. They were 38% reported uh, symptoms versus 22.3% symptoms being reported by Mexicans. Risk factors that we were able to identify for depression in Hispanics include cardiovascular disease and a, a long number of, of cardiovascular disease risk factors, cigarette smoking, and neurocognitive function. And then in the next slide, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so in summary, the SOUL study has influenced health and decision-making by, first of all, examining the prevalence of chronic diseases in a diverse sample of Hispanic Latinos so that clinicians are better able to identify groups that are at higher risk for certain conditions. Identifying risk factors for chronic disease in order to target interventions to prevent disease and identifying protective factors of disease that promote a healthier lifestyle. Next slide. With prospective data, uh, the sole investigators will be poised to understand what influences the incidence of disease over time and risk factors for mortality, and also to understand how social and environmental factors affect long-term health. Most of the results I shared with you today were from the, our baseline um, ex uh, clinical examination, uh, and we are now starting to report data from our second visit examination. And this data uh, will show the incidence of disease and mortality, and we are very excited to learn more about uh, what makes Hispanics healthy. So in the next few slides, you will see some references 
for all of the studies that I shared with you today in case you wanna glance through them. Um, there's three slides of references. Um, so feel free to jot down any of those that may um, pique your interest. And then finally, I'm welcome uh, any questions. Um, and if you'd rather contact me personally, I've included my email and I'd be happy to uh, talk with you regarding any questions you may have. Thank you, Dr. Cordero, for your wonderful presentation and work the Hispanic and Latino communities that are greatly needed now yeah. more than ever. <laughs> so now Ocean, he will introduce um, the next poll question. All yours, Ocean. Thank you, Christine. And before I begin, I just want to second Christine by saying thank you. Uh, Dr. Cordero for the great work you're doing. Reminds me a lot of the Framingham Heart Study that's going on, mm -hmm. um, you know, and we know the fits and uh, of that, you know, in, informing health decisions. So thank you so much for what you're doing. Uh, with, that, with that being said, we'll get started on our third polling question. Uh, it will launch momentarily, but I will start reading. The, oh, there it is. Uh, so the question. How important is it for diverse communities to participate in health research? Option A, very important. Option B, important. Option C, somewhat important. And option D, not at all important. And we'll give you all about, again, a minute to respond to this polling question. The 15 to 30 seconds. <clears throat> Awesome. I am glad to see that everyone here agrees that health research in diverse community, well, almost everyone, you know, a 4%, but it's all right. You know, a majority of people here agree that health research is definitely important in diverse communities. Um, and that's the whole premise of this presentation. And so, yeah, very happy to see this result. And now I'll pass it back to Christine. Thanks, Ojen, and thanks to everyone who participated in the poll. So if you have any questions for our panelists, please feel free to type them in the chat box and we will address as many of your questions as possible during our question and answer session, which will follow the facilitated discussion. So getting the right information is not just essential for understanding people's health. But it is also about getting information that will help researchers better understand health and disease. While there is a perception that it is too expensive to engage communities of color in health research, lack of participation sometimes comes down to more routine factors such as the transportation, the time commitment, childcare, among others. Most often it comes down to knowledge. So let's welcome our next panelist, who is Dr. Jose Pural Perales Puchalt. He's an assistant professor at the University of Kansas Alzheimer's Disease Center. His background is in psychology and public health. And in addition to conducting research in Spain, England, and in the United States, Dr. Perales has collaborated with teams from other countries in the Euro European Union and in the Americas. With a primary focus on reducing disparities related to dementia for Latinos, his research has led to the development of a dementia educational recruitment tool for Latinos. He has also studied the risk of dementia and mild cognitive impairment among sexual and ethnoracial minorities. So today, Dr. Perales will speak about perspective from a researcher, his best practices to advance health research in diverse populations. So welcome, Dr. Perez. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so first I wanted to say that um, my title is, um, the changes a little bit, but the best practices will be uh, embedded in the presentation as well. It's gonna be more of a pragmatic uh, presentation instead. 
So, so yeah, my name is Jaime Perales Puchal. I come from Spain, even though I work at the University of Kansas Alzheimer's Center here in Kansas City, and I'm an assistant professor. Um, um, my research interest is in understanding uh, dementia disparities and uh, minority health and also developing interventions for these communities, especially in the Latino community. Uh, so I'm here to talk about my most current research, um, and it's an intervention to help Latino caregivers care for their loved ones and themselves. And the intervention is via text messaging, and I explain later why. Um, my research is funded by the NIH, by different grants. Uh, this one specifically, uh, the NIA, the National Institute on Aging, uh, through an R21. Next slide, please. So this is the outline of my presentation. Next slide. Uh, and dementia has a devastating impact on family caregivers. Currently, there are more than 11 million Americans who provide unpaid care uh, for people with dementia, with different dementias. Um, something to note is that two thirds of these are women. So there's, a, there's already a disparity there. Um, usually spouses or children. Um, physically, caregivers have higher stress hormones, uh, a poorer immune system, and more physical symptoms such as pain, and also um, a, more, a higher medication use compared to those who are not caregivers. Psychologically, as you can see at the bottom uh, left, um, caregivers are more likely to have depression and anxiety disorders compared to caregivers of people with other uh, conditions and also compared to people who are not caregivers. Financially, as you can see on the right, um, caregivers have more financial difficulties compared to non-caregivers and caregivers of others as well. And, uh, and just to have a, an idea, about how um, the cost, uh, social cost of this, uh, family members and friends provided nearly 250 billion with a B uh, dollars in unpaid care um, for people living with Alzheimer's and other dementias in 2020, which is approximately 50% of the net revenue of Walmart for the same year. Next slide, please. So, if you're here, you probably know this probably as much as I do, or even better. So who are, why should we focus on Hispanics or Latinos? Here's the census definition. Uh, someone who identifies as someone of, of Cuban, Mexican, Puerto Rican, other Spanish descent, et cetera, et cetera, regardless of race. Uh, we use uh, Hispanic, Latino, Latinx interchangeably often, even though they all have their uh, peculiarities. Um, Latinos are a highly, diverse group as uh, the, uh, Dr. Cordero has expressed very, very clearly in the previous presentation, they, they can vary among other things in citizenship status, country of origin, ancestry, language proficiency, socioeconomic status, uh, insurance status, et cetera. And it, this map actually uh, maps pretty well with what Dr. Cordero exp ex uh, explained before is the represents the most frequent Latino slash Hispanic group in the United States by county. And as you can see, the broad ma the wide majority is of Mexican descent, but then if you go to the East Coast, you're gonna find more people of Puerto Rican descent. Uh, if you go more towards Miami, South Florida, it's gonna be more Cuban. And if you go to New Mexico, New Mexicans uh, or Spanish. Uh, next one, please. Here's uh, just another, uh, in a different way, another proof of that diversity uh, with regards to occupation, age, generation, uh, sexual expression, or facial features, for example. Next one, please. So again, why should we focus on Latinos? Latinos are the largest uh, minoritized group in the United States, and they're predicted to grow from approximately 17% right now up to 30% uh, by 2050. They have, uh, as you can see on the right, top right, uh, one of the longest life expectancies uh, in the United States only after non-Latino Asian Americans. Uh, and, and at the bottom right, you'll see that Latinos are the fastest growing aging segment in the United States as well, uh, when we combine a race and ethnicity in, within the same category. Uh, next one, please. And Latinos are also more likely than non-Latino whites to have uh, Alzheimer's and other dementias. And as you can see on the right, uh, it's a tsunami. There's, there's 
a lot of uh, Latinos that are going to be developing dementia in the next few decades. So there's a lot that we need to do uh, to help address this problem. Next slide, please. And why should we focus specifically on Latino caregivers? We're partly due to the low average uh, uh, income that Latinos uh, have and a sense of responsibility, a cultural sense of responsibility to care for their elders. Latinos are likely to become, more likely to become family caregivers than other groups. Um, systematic reviews show that uh, Latino caregivers in general and uh, caregivers uh, and of people with dementia in particular are more prone to be depressed and experience poor physical health than non-Latino whites. And as you can see on the right, uh, these, uh, this is a comparison of two different studies that use very similar methodology. And they basically found that uh, Latinos with dementia are more likely to have behavioral and psychological symptoms, which are the symptoms that impact uh, patients and caregivers most, more so than cognition itself. Um, and not just, uh, and we're not just talking about frequency, but also severity. Um, yeah, and finally, uh, Latinos, uh, Latino caregivers are less likely than non-Latino whites um, to access caregiver support groups. And this is especially true for those who are not fluent in English. Next slide. We should focus on Latino caregivers because despite there being uh, about 200, and that's a lot, 200 efficacious uh, caregiver interventions out there, uh, very few of them focus specifically on Latinos. Uh, results from uh, with other populations show that um, if we do, sorry, it results in general um, from, from these uh, systematic reviews show that results in, for example, a majority of non-Latino white caregivers are likely not, are not likely to generalize uh, to Latino caregivers. And that was a, a recent systematic review that showed that. And then um, designing interventions without taking into account Latinos are not including them in our research or tailoring the, to, to their culture and contextual factors may actually widen the disparities that I've already explained. Um, <clears throat> interventions uh, developed for the general population may also not consider a lot of factors that, are, that, are, um, that matter to the Latino population. So for example, Latinos are more likely to report time constraints. Uh, they're also uh, more likely to report that uh, attending caregiver uh, support interventions in person is burdensome. Um, they're also more likely to report unreliable transportation, which is something that was recently, um, recently uh, mentioned by uh, Christine, Christine Perez. Um, and uh, they also find it very difficult to find a caregiver substitute, to find some respite, for example. Um, Latinos have one of the lowest incomes, as I've already mentioned, and that means that they're more likely uh, to find um, caregiver uh, support programs as costly, as expensive. There's also the language barriers that we all know. Uh, there's a large percentage of Latinos uh, whose language is, first language is Spanish, and many of them, that's their only language and their English proficiency is not good. You know, and, and there's also many interventions out there that do not have the ability to provide this intervention in Spanish. Um, and then uh, there's also cultural values. Um, generally, caregiver interventions are developed for a, a primary caregiver. However, in Latinos, we know that caregiver tasks are usually shared among different family members. Next slide, please. So, Text messaging might be one of the solutions to all these barriers that I mentioned earlier. Um, it has a higher reach potential, surely, than, um, for example, in-person caregiver support groups, but also other modalities that you can see on these graphs, such as computers, internet, video chatting, etc. There's other reasons for which uh, text messaging interventions might be uh, particularly helpful. If it's, if it's an autom automatic messaging, we're ensuring that the fidelity of the intervention is high instead of you know, uh, the intervention having to vary depending on the interventionist. Um, effectiveness of previous text message intervention has already been shown for several 
behavioral issues such as smoke and cessation, uh, compliance with medication, um, depression, and other, and other types of interventions. Um, there's also the ability to deploy this intervention anywhere. So anywhere in the United States, any, or Puerto Rico, et cetera, whether you're in a rural area, urban area, and also at any time, I can send it to you in the morning and you might be working, but then at lunchtime, you check your phone and, you, and, that, and that's the way you access the intervention. Um, there's also potential for cost, effect, cost effectiveness given the uh, low reliance on, 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 on humans, especially. Um, um, there's also potential for personalization. You can text specific messages, specific keywords that can get you uh, to specific messages that are in line with your needs, or we can tailor the text message to your language or to, to your culture or many other characteristics. Uh, then there's the privacy thing that you don't need to go to a specific, to a clinic, for example, which can it could create a stigma to some extent, right? So getting the text message on your phone is going to address that. And then in previous studies uh, with uh, smoke and cessation, for example, in our case, in, in my team, uh, we have shown that it really engages Latinos. Latinos are really engaged in this, and we believe that the higher engagement might lead to a higher efficacy. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this is our grant, uh, an R21 MDPI, and, the, and this is the one from the NI that I mentioned, National Institute on Aging. And the main goal is to develop and text the first text message caregiver uh, support intervention for Latinos. Uh, we call it Quita text. It's a six month text message intervention. It is bilingual, uh, English and Spanish. It's bi-directional. The people, the uh, caregivers receive messages, but they can also send messages. Uh, it has different components, uh, such as education. Uh, we can train them in, uh, for example, relaxation techniques or how to address problematic behaviors in their loved ones. Uh, and it's based on a model called, uh, called the stress process model. It's a two-year grant. Um, it was funded uh, September 2020. And the first uh, aim is to develop the intervention, most really, most really relying on caregiver uh, so um, caregiver working groups. So to, in a way to listen to, uh, listen to the community, also listening to professionals uh, of uh, caregiving, professionals of dementia care, especially in the Latino community, and then also basing everything on the um, evidence-based interventions that are, already, that are already out there and uh, pilot testing it with, with, uh, with Latino caregivers too. Uh, on the second aim, we're going to test it. Um, it's basically testing it uh, among 20 to 60 care, Latino caregivers. Uh, next, next slide, please. And that should be, I believe, the last one. Um, so for AIM one, we've performed the intervention uh, by other, uh, with yeah, through other uh, evidence-based interventions such as Reach Savvy Caregiver, um, some Alzheimer's Association uh, in information such as Fotonovelas that has fotonovelas that, that are basically like comics slash soap operas that were very popular among Latinos and have shown to reduce depression already in Latino caregivers, um, reducing disability in Alzheimer's disease and, and National Institute on Aging um, information as well. Uh, we have conducted five working group sessions with Latino caregivers and four with experts in Latino dementia caregiver research and clinical care. Uh, there's many Take home messages from these meeting from these uh, sessions, but uh, for the sake of time, I will keep it simple. Uh, and then we plan to test. Uh, we're, we're on aim. We're going to start aim two very soon on August second, and we plan to test this intervention among twenty to sixty Latino caregivers. And this is going to be nationally. It's not just going to be Kansas City, even though I'm sure we'll have more people from Kansas. Uh, it's going to be a one-arm trial, so everyone is going to go to the same intervention group. Um, and so it's going to be, as I mentioned, six months. We're going to have a pre, uh, a baseline, and a post assessment. Um, and we're basically mostly interested in um, acceptability, and that is uh, satisfaction and feasibility, whether people got messages, how much they interact, et cetera. Even though we are also measuring, you know, typical outcomes such as caregiver depression, uh, burden, well being. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So, please feel free to refer if you know any caregiver, Latino caregiver of, of someone with dementia, 
uh, here in the United States, uh, please refer them our way and, uh, and we would love to include them in our study. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Perales, for your presentation, as well as your commitment to engaging with the Latino community in health research, particularly in the Alzheimer's disease. So now Ocean will present our fourth and final poll question. Awesome. And yeah, just a second, uh, Christine, again, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Perales. You know, it was great to hear about some of the risk factors affecting the Latino community that Dr. Cordero talked about that are leading to some of these negative health, health outcomes amongst uh, the Latino population. Um, so yeah, for our fourth polling question, um, it'll be launched soon, here it is. What are some concerns you might have about participating in health research? Option A, privacy issues. Option B, misuse of data. Option C, none. And option D, other. Um, and you know, if you select other, um, if you're comfortable, feel free to type what your concerns are in the chat. Um, you know, we'll give about a minute or two for those answering this poll or who might be typing an answer in the chat. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so I see a lot that there's, there is a split between <clears throat> privacy issues and misuse of data. Um, you know, a good percentage of people selected none. Um, you know, I, I believe as researchers, um, you know, I'm sure Dr. Uh, Podero and Dr. Perales could talk about the importance of uh, uh, correctly using the data and uh, the importance of privacy. Um, but again, that's what we're also here to talk about, um, you know, um, throughout this presentation, uh, Dr. Cordero, Dr. Perales, and now uh, Christina will talk about uh, some of those issues or concerns that uh, you all may have regarding health research. So thank you. And now with that, um, I would like to give it back to Christine. Thank you, Ocean. So it's a fact that the lack of inclusion when determining how we administer health care in the United States leads to poor health outcomes. We seem to forget that creating an equitable healthcare system for aging Hispanics and all underserved communities starts well before an individual gets sick or goes to a healthcare facility. The foundations begin with health research itself. So the All of Us Research Program was created by the National Institutes of Health or NIH with the aim of enrolling volunteers of diverse backgrounds into a database to better understand how diseases develop and how we might be able to treat them in the future. So the All of Us Research Program is an important step toward ensuring that health research works for all Americans. The program aims to create the largest health database ever by enrolling 1 million or more volunteers from across America. Recently, the program launched its research hub, which matches a broad research community with diverse set of research participants from the program. The research hub houses one of the largest, most diverse, and most broadly accessible data sets ever assembled. So it also provides an interactive data browser where anyone can learn about the type and quantity of data that all of us collects. But let's hear more about it with our next panelist. So our next, next speaker is Ms. Cristina Pacheco. She is the Director of Development and Policy for the National Hispanic Council on Aging. She holds a Juris Doctor and a Master of Public Health with a concentration in social and behavioral health. She is currently pursuing an interdisciplinary PhD in bioinformatics and public administration. Ms. Pacheco has worked in the field of public health for over 10 years, in the field of policy and law for more than 12 years, 
and also in the field of social justice and racial reconciliation for more than 20 years. So Ms. Pacheco is a community-based participatory researcher whose interests focus on health inequities faced by indigenous and in the Latino communities. So today, Ms. Pacheco will speak about advancing health research by providing a brief overview about the All of Us Research Hub and WorkBench, tools that are created for researchers from different backgrounds. So welcome, Ms. Pacheco. Yeah, so I will be speaking about the All of Us Research Program and our role at the National Hispanic Council on Aging is really to facilitate the education and engagement of Latino older adults, their families and caregivers in this program. You can switch slides, that would be fantastic. Next slide. So the National Hispanic Council on Aging is a partner of the Community and Provider Gateway Initiative funded by the National Institutes of Health, the All of Us Research Program. CPGI is a network of community-based and provider organizations across the United States that support the All of Us Research Program. Um, and again, we facilitate the education and engagement of Latino older adults um, in this program. Next slide. I'm gonna start talking a little bit about precision medicine, which is a developing method for disease treatment and prevention that takes into account an individual's differences in their genes, environment, and lifestyle. Although the term precision medicine is relatively new, the concept has been a part of healthcare for many years. For example, a person who needs a blood transfusion isn't given blood from a random, randomly selected donor. Instead, the donor's blood type is matched to the recipient to reduce any risks of complications. Examples of precision medicine can be found in several areas. Think of prescription glasses, hearing aids, insulin pumps. However, the role of precision medicine in day-to-day -day healthcare has been limited. Researchers hope that this approach will expand to many areas of health and healthcare in the coming years. Next. And this shows the difference between traditional medicine and precision medicine. Traditional medicine has worked on a one-size-fits-all approach. In this method, disease treatment and prevention strategies are developed for an average person, generally based on those who participate in research, with less consideration for the differences between people. Precision medicine, on the other hand, acknowledges that each person is unique. Our habits, our environments, and our biology and the interaction of these factors greatly impact our health. These unique variables also mean that medical treatment that works for one person might not work for the next person. So rather than using a cookie cutter, one size fits all approach, precision medicine aims to deliver the right treatment for the right person at the right time that enables us to keep people healthier longer. Ultimately, precision medicine may produce more accurate diagnoses, earlier detection, and better preventive strategies and treatment choices. Precision medicine is a radical shift in how each of us can receive the best care based on our unique makeup. Next slide. The All of Us Research Program is a precision medicine effort to bring together 1 million or more participants who reflect the diversity of people living in the United States who volunteer their health data over a decade or more. The program is open to people both healthy and sick from all communities. Unlike a single research study focused on a specific disease or population, All of Us serves as a national research resource to inform thousands of studies covering a wide variety of health conditions. Think of it as a data repository. All of us, led by the National Institutes of Health, is the cornerstone of Precision Medicine Initiative that was launched in January 2015 with the goal of moving forward the promises of precision medicine. A set of core values are central to this program and guide the program's commitment to doing things differently. Some of the values include that the participation is open to all, participants need to reflect the rich diversity of the United States, and that the data will be accessed broadly for research purposes. Next slide. The mission is to really accelerate health research and medical breakthroughs, enabling individualized prevention, treatment, and care for all of us. There are three primary objectives to achieve this bold mission. One is to build and nurture trusted relationships with participants. 
to deliver a valuable, rich resource of data, which will be accessible in new ways, and three, to catalyze a robust ecosystem of researchers who want to use the data. Next. Why do we even need something like the All of Us Research Program? And we're gonna really focus on the biomedical researchers box that's at the end. Researchers spend a lot of time and resources creating new uh, information technology systems, databases, analytical tools. They face enormous costs just and, um, and time trying to recruit participants that look like the populations that we serve. And then the data collected is often not standardized. Um, the All of Us Research Program helps achieve and overcome all of the barriers that biomedical researchers face with regards to these elements. Next slide. This is a, a kind of an idea of how the All of Us program works. So first participants share their data. The data is protected, which I will go into a little bit more in detail in the next couple of slides. Researchers study the data. The data get given back to the participants and then researchers share the discoveries. Today, I'm going to focus on how researchers can access the data for different studies. Next slide. This is an example of the different types of data that are collected. Um, they collect information on environment, so proximity that a person lives to the highway, their zip code, air pollution, water quality. They also look at social elements like a person's upbringing, their religion, their financial needs, um, stress, biological and clinical elements like mental health, the medications they're taking. Um, they have access to electronic health records if a participant gives them that access. And then also behavioral elements like exercise, your eating um, and drinking habits, your drug usage, your smoking history, different routines that you engage in. Next slide. As addressed in one of the polls, a lot of people are concerned about privacy and security. The All of Us Research Program's most important responsibility is to safeguard our participants' identity and data, and the program is using the highest standards of privacy and data security to protect participant data and information. The program knows that participants want to understand what data will be collected and how it will be returned to them, and they absolutely want to assure that their data is being protected from the highest standards. From the beginning, the program has implemented privacy and security principles to help ensure participant data is as safe as possible. Next slide. There are different selected scientific opportunities, um, and these include developing quantitative estimates of risk, identifying causes of individual variation, discovering biological markers that can signal an increase or decrease risk of developing a common disease, using mobile and health technologies, empowering study participants, and then creating a platform to enable tri uh, trials of targeted therapies. This is what all of us brings to the research community. Next slide. And the way to access that is through the All of Us Research Hub, which stores health data from diverse groups of participants across the United States. Approved researchers can access this data and tools to conduct studies and help improve the understanding of human health. You access that through www.researchallofus.org. Next slide. You do have to be, apply to become an All of Us researcher, and this shows the different steps. The workbench is open to researchers whose institutions have signed a data use and registration agreement with the All of Us Research Program. Researchers at this time must also have an ERA Commons account and complete all of the All of Us Research Program data access processes before they can access the workbench and reg register to your data. For more information, visit the data and access use page. If you are a researcher who does not have an ERA Commons account, you can work with your institution to create one. Once your account is established, then you can access the workbench. Next slide. There are several tools that anyone um, has access to. Um, and 
Those include the data browser and data snapshots. Participant data available for research include information from electronic health records, physical measurements, biosamples, survey responses, and wearable data. They add new participant data sources as the program grows. We're gonna take a look at what the snapshot and browser provide. Next slide. Under the data snapshot, you can see aggregated public facing data um, for, and see an overview of the All of Us Research Program participant characteristics and the types of data collected from participants. There are of the All of Us participant journey. More than 486,000 people have registered with the program by creating online accounts at joinallofus.org, thus beginning the enrollment process. The snapshot below highlights participants in the program. And the following numbers are approximated to protect participants' privacy. The numbers reflect data collected through June 23rd, 2021. So as you can see, um, the red line on the graph shows the number of participants and the blue line shows the participants who have completed the initial steps of the program. Next slide. So again, this will give you just a snapshot of who has participated. And since diversity and inclusion is such a big premise for the All of Us Research Program, this gives you kind of an overview of who they have been able to recruit. So 50%, over 50% of um, folks included have uh, identified as racial and ethnic minorities, and over 80% are underrepresented in biomedical research. Um, the largest number of participants are white, but you have 21.8% are Black or African American, 17.2% Hispanic, uh, Latino or Spanish, um, roughly 6.5% identify as more than one race, 2.9% uh, are Asian, and 2.9% are other. Next slide. The data browser provides interactive views of publicly available All of Us Research Program participant data. Currently, participants provided information, including surveys and physical measurements taken at the time of enrollment, as well as electronic health record data are available. EHR data are reported by healthcare providers and are not participant recorded. The All of Us Research Program data will include more data types over time. As of October 2020, the data includes 316,760 participants. In order to protect participant privacy, the data are de-identified, limited to aggregate counts, rounded to counts of 20, and summary demographic information. As you can see on this slide, it shows the different domains in the electronic health record. So 24,770 conditions um, are represented there are uh, 27,702 procedures that are reported on. And then it shows you the survey questions. And so if you want to know um, what questions are asked about healthcare access and utilization, there are 57 questions in the All of Us Research Program that deal with that. And you can open up that box and see what those questions are. Next slide. When you get into the researcher workbench, um, once you have applied and um, been granted access, the platform and its suite of custom tools are available to approved researchers. It provides access to registered tier data. Its powerful tools support data analysis and collaboration. The workbench also provides integrated health and educational resources through the workbench user support hub. And these are just some of the, the assets that are available to registered um, researchers. Next slide. And if you could play the video, that would be fantastic. We were really interested to look at the prevalence of mood disorder diagnosis in the electronic health records that we have received from all of us participants. Uh, we understand that um, this is a very ambitious effort to form such a diverse database, and uh, which is really unprecedented. So we already have some knowledge about uh, mood disorder prevalence across this country and even you know worldwide, um, and we're very curious of how the rates are going to compare. We are actually able to find um, uh, very comparable rates. The 
early results that we're getting is uh, very encouraging. With it, our, us being in such an early stage of the program, that's great. I am a clinical psychologist and uh, really spent my career in research studies where either I had to collect my own data, you know, and recruit my own participants, or maybe use other people's data, which is usually in a database and dry, you know, rows of data, and I have to use my own statistical package to make sense of it. Um, the fact that there isn't this um, interface where it's a, there's a, already a portal um, that has graphics and numbers and pictures and help uh, desk and FAQs uh, was really exciting um, for uh, researchers to be able to be exposed to that, uh, which is of course super necessary because at the end we want this portal and this uh, workbench to be uh, usable for as many people as possible. Um, so it was really exciting uh, to be in this space where I also know that I'll be able to collaborate with other people if I want to. So that's definitely been um, super exciting. The way I see myself using the workbench is to again make me reach out to other researchers so that we can form work groups to answer questions that perhaps will have bigger impact public health wise. With the availability of this type of portal, that's going to be so much more possible because uh, the data is already housed in a secure platform and all we need to do is to work together to form uh, the research questions we want to answer and, um, and to collaborate and that's um, super exciting. So with the All of Us Research Program, the future of health really begins with you, the participants and the researchers. Next slide. To learn more or answer any additional questions you have about the program, we urge you to visit the program site at joinallofus.org. You can also follow the program on social media at, join, at hashtag joinallofus. And for researchers, you can access researchallofus.org. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pacheco. So if you're interested, as Christina mentioned, in knowing more about the All of Us Research Hub, we invite you to stay tuned for our upcoming virtual events where we will have a speaker from actually the program to talk further about, the, about this research hub. Again, Thank you to our panelists for sharing their experiences and insights in health research. Now let's begin with a question and answer session that will be moderated by Ocean. Awesome. Thank you, Christine. And thank you to the presenters today for their wonderful uh, uh, presentations. It was very insightful to listen to. Uh, we have a, a slew of questions here that we got in. Um, I know we have uh, 20 minutes left, and so I'm going to try and get through them as uh, fast as I can. I believe the first one is for Dr. Quadero, um, and it reads, it is interesting how you were able to use a longitudinal study to guide health and decision making. What did that process look like? What research findings, if any, are now used in practice and or treatment? Hi, Ocean. Thank you for that question. Um, what did that process look like? Um, I think the key step in that process was in the very beginning um, with the study design, the SOI uh, investigators wanted to identify gaps in what we knew about Hispanic health. Uh, two main things that came up were first that we didn't know differences by Hispanic Latino background. Uh, we also didn't know how acculturation and environment affects Hispanic health. Um, and we didn't know if there were any risk factors that were specific to Hispanics uh, that haven't emerged in other studies that were predominantly done in, in non-Hispanic populations. Um, so knowing those gaps kind of uh, helped us uh, design our study and that's where the process all began. Um, we've been collecting data for a while now. Um, since 2008, the study has been going. This is our, our 15th year of the study, so we call it the quinceañera year. Um, and we're very happy with the results we have, but we know that um, the results that are yet to come 
are the ones that are going to be be giving us the major um, um, uh, uh, impact in terms of changing practice and treatment. Um, I think um, what we're seeing now is helping us identify how uh, certain background groups are at higher risk for disease uh, than we thought they were. So um, I think in terms of how it's used in practice and treatment right now, uh, we've been disseminating our results and we hope that uh, uh, clinicians are using that if they work with the Hispanic population to be able to better identify people who, who may be at higher risk for chronic diseases. Hello, uh, may I interrupt? Is it possible? Oh yeah, sure, Dr. Perales, go ahead and chime and in. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to chime in, uh, perhaps not, um, what I'm saying is more related to research, but it definitely helps us uh, structure the significance of our research when we when we write a grant or when we develop an intervention, we base it on these prevalence estimates that, these, that the Sol study, for example, uh, is giving us as well. And they also use, uh, they also validate uh, tools in the Latino population, English and Spanish, that otherwise we would not have. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's super important. And um, uh, at least one of the tools that, that I'm using, one of the outcome tools, uh, the CES, uh, C uh, C C -E -S -D. <laughs> there, there you go. So the, the 10 item one, I'm, I'm going to use as an outcome in my study. And it was validated by the SOL study. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Dr. Perales, and you know, seeing how <clears throat> other research studies uh, could be the model for another research study and everything. Um, moving on, this next question. I believe is for all panelists on here. So I'm just gonna read it and you know, whoever feels inclined to answer it, just please do. Uh, it reads, research often takes a long time from start to finish and participants often want immediate feedback. How can researchers better meet participants' expectations? Um, I'm happy to start. Uh, so as a okay. community-based participatory researcher, I engage in the end of the research process. And um, so we talk to them up front about the timeline needed for research. The other thing that we are happy to do is we do um, uh, provide updates on our research, how many participants are enrolled, if we do any kind of preliminary data analysis that gets included. Um, and disseminated to in a format that is easy to consume. Um, and then we also have given presentations and attended community meetings. Um, so that way participants also get updates in person. And if they have questions, um, we're able to reach them that way as well. So that way they don't have to wait for five or six years to find out what we have discovered um, after they have participated in research. Definitely. Thank you for sharing, Christina. <clears throat> uh, anyone? Okay. I'll move on to the next question. Uh, question three. How do we overcome the high rates of distrust and concern amongst diverse communities with regards to participating in health research? And I'll leave the floor open uh, for anyone. So I, I don't think there's necessarily high rates of this rust. Perhaps uh, in, in some cases it's more uh, researchers uh, not developing interventions for specific communities or not taking them into account. And if there's anything related to trust is more trustworthiness than trust itself. So it's not the, it's not the individual, but it's how we make ourselves be trusted. Um, and so, to me, the best thing is to develop your, your, your research together with the community, engage them from before you, you develop interventions. You already, you, have, you already need to go to the community to, prov to listen to them, what are their needs and provide them what their, what their needs are uh, and listen to them when you develop an intervention, develop it together with them, with advisory board groups, piloting it with them, getting their feedback on satisfaction, qualitative data, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so all those things are very important and showing up 
um, instead of just showing up all of a sudden and, bring, and throwing money, no, we need years of working with them, not necessarily always for research, and you know, uh, to partner with their community organizations, community groups, religious groups, et cetera, et cetera, to show, to, to gain that trustworthiness. Because as I said, I, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's that they don't trust us necessarily, but we haven't done enough to gain their trust. Thank you for sharing, Dr. Perales. I totally agree with everything you're saying. Um, and, you know, it honestly relates to the next question that we got here. Um, you know, what can researchers and community organizations do to overcome the barriers diverse communities face uh, to engaging health research? Uh, you talked about it there. I think it start, you, uh, it starts with, you know, researchers and providers engaging, starting that uh, conversation and uh, engaging diverse communities. But um, if there are any other, uh, you know, best practices to overcome barriers that, um, you know, that our panelists want to share, feel free. I think establishing a relationship with your participants is really important. Um, a lot of our staff are, are know our participants. Um, they call them once a year when the, they come in, the same staff sees them. And then we do things around um, our site to make sure that they feel welcome. Uh, we have cafecito for them because a large proportion of our population is Cuban. We make sure we have pastelitos and little things for them to eat. And um, we kind of make them feel like they're at home when they're participating in our study. Um, and also our study staff is a majority Hispanic from the community. So they see our study staff as a family member, not just as, you know, going into a, a doctor's office with cold white lights. It's, it's more uh, of an invite, inviting environment. So I think that's a, a really big reason and why we've been able to um, not just continue to follow this, these participants, but retaining a large proportion of them, which is, has been really difficult to do over all these years. Um, Another thing is if you don't have relationships with a particular community and you're, and you're working with a community that is not of your own, um, it's really helpful to partner with community-based organizations. Um, and we have had researchers partner with the National Hispanic Council on Aging. Um, they buy out our staff's time. Um, and our staff then become kind of their research staff and help make those connections and um, know the community and are able to um, really serve as advisors to the researcher. And I think that has been a, a very useful uh, model that we have used with folks who are new to conducting research um, in communities of color, particularly if they are not um, a researcher of color. Thank you for sharing, Christina. Um, Dr. Perales, uh, I think you were gonna say something. Well, um... So the, uh, I wanted to say that definitely, as Dr. Cordero mentioned, the paradigm of you have your research study and people will come to you, that's not gonna work with underrepresented groups. Uh, be it ethnically minoritized or be it socioeconomic status or, or whatever, you need to go to them in some way. Um, and also to increase their, um, their representativity. Um, let me see. Oh yeah. The importance of including uh, culturally and linguistically uh, proficient slash humble, uh, you know, uh, staff in your team is very important. And also uh, to be careful with eligibility criteria and try to make it as flexible as possible so that you can include as many, you know, as many people as you can. Because uh, minoritized groups tend to have, in, in many cases, worse. Uh, um, health outcomes that are usually used to exclude uh, participants. So we gotta be particularly careful with those. Um, and also obviously uh, um, eligibility criteria could also be speaking English only, which excludes a lot of Latinos and Hispanics, for example. 
Awesome. Thank you for sharing, Dr. Perales, uh, Dr. Cordero, Christina. Those were all really helpful tips, and I'm sure the audience uh, found those helpful. Um, and so building off of that, um, this one's particular to uh, the Hispanic uh, Latinx uh, communities. Um, you know, we talked about how uh, the Hispanic Latinx populations may differ from background, region, uh, so on and so forth. And so what should, what should researchers know about Hispanics and Latinx communities if they want to engage uh, them in their studies? And I'll leave this, anyone who wants to answer this one. I, I can answer. Uh, well, what they, uh, there was very well explained in the first talk, they're a very diverse group. And what you need to do is not to label them as this or that, but rather just go to them and understand them first. Uh, and the whole thing that I mentioned earlier to create these uh, to the, you know, as much as possible, these, um, advisory board meetings to learn from them uh, is gonna be helpful. But obviously, uh, if, you wanna, if you wanna base uh, what you do on, on, on statistical, epidemiological, or that kind of data, just, just make sure that you, that you pay attention to, to that kind of stuff, like were they, born, were they born in the United States? Where were they born? How many years have they been in the United States? Uh, what race did they identify with? What language, what's their primary language? Uh, uh, you know, and all those things are gonna, are gonna affect outcomes in one way or another. Awesome, thank you. Thank you for sharing Dr. Perales. Um, you know, it was, like you said, it was very well explained um, in the first presentation. Um, you know, I got a, lot, a, a little bit of information myself on like the thrifty phenotype, thrifty genotype phenomenon that's going on with Pima Indians and stuff like that. And so it's great to hear uh, all of those things uh, come into light in, in these uh, research studies. Um, yeah, I think, unfortunately, we won't have time to answer the rest of these questions. Uh, you know, we have till 3.30. Uh, with that being said, um, I'm gonna pass it back to Christine to close it off. And I'm sure these questions will be answered uh, and sent to the uh, individuals who asked them. Thank you, Ocean, and thank you to all the panelists. So as discussed in today's webinar, research participation benefits our communities and future generations by unlocking keys to treatments for many diseases, such as the newly approached COVID-19 vaccines. For more information and research, visit, visit our blogs at www.nacoa.org. And for more information on the All of Us Research Program, visit www.joinallofus.org slash together. Again, thank you to our sponsor of the All of Us Research Program, our panelists, and to all of you, our attendees, for joining us for today's virtual event. We invite you to follow us on our social media platforms you can find us as at NACOA, NHCOA on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And also in our website for the latest information about participating in research and for upcoming webinars. Until the next one, bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone.